I'll be presenting principles of blood transfusion in surgery. My outline. Blood originates from a Greek word called hyma. It's a highly specialized circulating tissue which has several types of cells suspended in a liquid medium called plasma. Blood is a life-sustaining fluid which keeps us warm, provides nutrients to cells, tissues, and organs, and also helps in removing waste products. So this is the historical background of blood transfusion. Blood transfusion has been taking place since in the 16th. The first successful one was in 1828. But however, even after the first successful one, people were dying. So in 19th, Lansena, the beloved the ABO group, where he found out that when we mix blood of two individuals, it leads to blood clumping, and clumped cells can crack, causing toxic reactions, which could be fatal. So it was after the introduction of the ABO grouping that blood transfusion became safer. 1916, we had our first blood storage use. Well, in 1939, we had the resource factor, which was described by Levin. So what is blood transfusion? Blood transfusion is the act of giving whole blood or components of blood to a patient for therapeutic purposes. It involves the transfer of compatible blood products, such as red blood cells, plasma, platelets, or other cellular elements from a healthy donor to a recipient in either to replace the blood or to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of that patient. Blood transfusion should only be considered when the benefit outweighs the risk. The improvement in donor selection, blood screening, and component, and component isolation more blood transfusion available too for a surgeon. So the aims of blood transfusion is to maintain adequate tissue oxygenation, optimization of hemostasis, and also to improve patient's well-being. Types of blood transfusion, it could be autologous or allogenic. Autologous blood transfusion is the reinfusion of patients on blood. It's the surface type of blood transfusion. Then allogenic, this is when blood transfusion is done with blood from another compatible donor to the same species. The allogenic is life-saving, but then there are risks of disease transmission and also allergic reactions. Then we have excellent blood transfusion. Excellent blood transfusion is the process which involves removal of patient's blood completely and replacing it with fresh blood or plasma of the donor. Example, in sickle cell disease, if a school cell patient has an abnormal PCV, let's say a very high PCV or abnormal Doppler, would want to do excellent blood transfusion or in case of polycythemia, hemolytic disease of the newborn and disseminated intravascular blood donation. So for every blood transfusion procedure, we have to donate blood. So these are the criteria. The person donating the blood must fit before donating the blood. All blood donors should be healthy and adults between 18 to 65 years. If someone is less than 18 years, they have to have parental consent. Then they should have a weight of greater than 50 kg. And the HB in men should be greater than 13 gram per deciliter. That is a PCV of 39. Then HB of 12 gram per deciliter in women, a PCV of at least 36. Then someone should not transfuse Oh, sorry, someone should not have to donate more than three times in a year. And then the interval between one transfusion and the other should be at least one week. Then pregnant and lactating women should be excluded. A pregnant woman should not donate blood because we have anemia in pregnancy and informed consent. A person should not have any tattoo or piercings, chronic kidney disease. They should not be vaccinated in the last four weeks. And you should make sure you screen them for infections like HIV, HBV, and syphilis. So during, before the nation, you have to examine this donor thoroughly from head to toe. Make sure you check his weight. The weight should be greater than 51 kg. Then check his BP. He should not be hypertensive or pulse rate. A pulse rate of greater than 100 mg per minute with the thinking matter the patient is anemic. Then you should also do your examination in the case of blood transfusion, severe hemorrhage following trauma or tumor, when we have to correct anemia preoperatively during major operation in which blood is inevitable and postoperative anemia, and to also arrest hemorrhage or as a prophylactic measure prior to operation in patients with hemorrhagic state, also in anemia of chronic surgical condition. Blood components could be whole blood, heart cells, platelets, fresh frozen plasma frozen plasma, prime, precipitate, immunoglobulins, albumin, and granulocytes. What is whole blood? Whole blood is unsecreted blood. This is a blood that contains all the constituents of blood. It has the red blood cells, the platelets, the plasma. It's 
one of its advantages is how blood can be stored for up to 35 days and it is used when there is massive blood loss up to 20 percent volume or in case of trauma or excess blood transfusion but while giving whole blood you have to know that after five days we, the platelets per component of it will not be active because the viability of platelet is around four to five days the packed results are prepared by centrifuging whole blood and removing the plasma and platelet components resulting in concentrated suspension of red blood cells it is used in treatment of anemia from either acute blood loss, chronic condition, or surgical procedures. These are the indications of packed cells, a massive blood loss, anemia of chronic disease, hemoglobinopathies in perioperative period. When the HP is less than 7 grams per deciliter, you cannot transfuse if someone has a HP of greater than 10 grams per deciliter. Also, you can also transfuse um, packed cells when you know that the patient has comorbidities. For example, if they have congestive heart failure, threats, they are separated from the plasma by centrifugation. It is supplied as a single donor unit or as a combination of multiple donors. For one unit of platelets, it increases the platelet count by 5 to 10,000 millimeter, millimeter cube. And the viability, as I've said before, is five, 4 to 5 days. Then you can store it at a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. So what are the indications of platelet transfusion? It could be used when there is thrombocytopenia. This is when the platelet count is less than 50,000. DIC, aplastic anemia, fresh frozen plasma is dropped from whole blood and it is obtained by separating and freezing the liquid portion of the blood within eight hours of collection. So it is stored in 18 to 30 degrees Celsius and can last for a year. For each unit of FP, we have 250 ml. It contains plasma proteins and it could be used when we have bleeding due to excess warfarin, vitamin K deficiency, liver pathology, in case of DIC, dilutional coagulopathy, and inherited factor. Frozen plasma, the plasma that is frozen within 24 hours of collection, it maintains the level of protein except the factor 8. It has the same indication as FFP. Then cryoprecipitates. The FFP that is stored at 4 degrees Celsius and centrifuge is cryoprecipitated. And it contains a lot of factors like the fibrinogen factor 13 and the von Willebrand factor. Sources of fibrinogen is acquired in acquired coagulopathies as DIC and platelet dysfunction in urea. It is indicated in case of bleeding in bone deliverance disease and factor certain deficiency, how do we store our blood? The collection of blood should be done under strict exceptions. Collectible bag is sterile bag, which contains at least 16 ml of the CPB. CPB is citrate phosphate dextrose. These are the preservative and anticoagulants. So for the ACB, that is the acid citrate dextrose, it has a viability, it could be viable for 21 days in vitro. And the use of CPB, it, ha it extends the shelf life of the blood to 28 days, while the CPBA extends the shelf life to 35 days. So the CPBA is a solution that is used currently in the storage of blood, and it has 63 ml of anticoagulant. So to say we are, we are using one kind of blood, that is our 450 ml, it has that where it should serve. So for each 450, we we'll have 63 ml of the anticoagulant. Phosphate and adenine components of the CPBA gives ATP metabolites and then the dextrose gives us energy. The so effect of storage, red blood cells, 1% of cell population are lost per day. Let's just say we have our blood, then you start that blood for, let's say, 30 days. So for each day, 1% of cell will be lost. So by the 30th day, you know that you have lost 30% of your red blood cells. You'll be transfusing that patient with only 70% of the red blood cells. Then also we have the viability that decreases as ATP and 2 3 diphosphorates level 4. After about a week of storage, the level of 2 3 diphosphoglycerate falls. And what it does is it has high affinity. It makes it be to have high affinity to oxygen and depresses the oxygen release to tissue. So our tissue will have less oxygen and our head will have more oxygen. We have the leukocyte and platelets. Leukocyte and platelets are not viable after 24 hours of storage. It survives for 30 to 90 minutes in the recipient's blood. Then we have our electrolytes. Electrolytes, especially potassium, the levels increase at a rate of one millimole per day. 
the potassium diffuses out of the red cell. Let's say we have a blood that has been hot for 10 days. It means we'll have 10 millimoles per liter of potassium. You know how we transfuse blood to people that have chronic kidney disease? So giving them such type of blood will predispose them more to hyperkalemia. As hyperkalemia will result into cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrest. And the sodium concentration increases because of the sodium citrate in the CPBA anticoagulant. While the calcium, what it does is displaces the sodium in the anticoagulant, forming an ionized non calcium citrate. Also, the pH falls between from 7.2 to 6.8, and it is as a result of increase of lactic acid concentration from continual anaerobic red blood cell glycolysis. Then the protein factors, they lost activity by seven days. Then plasma hemoglobin rises due to leakage of HP from the cells and ammonia, which is the waste product, also increases. So that's why we do not want to give blood that has been stored for a long time to patients unless the benefit outweighs the risk. So we have the blood grouping. We, there are more than 30 blood grouping systems. The most important blood group is the ABO and resource. The ABO system is just on the antigen A and B. So we have our, in our red dorsal, we have the ABO antigen and we have the resource antigen. So the ABO, we, the antigen for either the A or B or AB. We do not have our AO antigen, sorry. So the resource is based on presence of anti, antigen B. We have other blood groups such as the Keldorf, B, Kida. We have what is called the Maximal Surgical Blood Ordering Schedule, which is a system of blood ordering for elective surgery. What happens is blood banks know the standard requirement for each blood procedure. So for patients that are at high risk of bleeding, you have to have an extra pint or more blood at the bank seat. And for patients with previous history of reaction, let's say allergic reaction after blood transfusion, you could consider giving them preoperative autologous blood donation that is from their own reinfusion of patients on blood investigation. Before transfusing blood to a patient, you have to do full blood count, the blood grouping and cross matching, the results. You have to screen that blood for infection, hepatitis, syphilis, hepatitis B, C, and then you should make sure it does not have any malaria parasite to prevent transfusion to malaria. The principle of blood transfusion. Before blood transfusion, you have to explain the procedure to the patient. He gives his consent uh, so that you not go and transfuse blood to person that people that do not receive blood like Jehovah Witness. With a partner, make sure you check the details against transfusion slip, the name, the age, the hospital number, so that you not go and give someone blood that is not theirs. Then check the patient detail against the unit and ensure that the patient has venous access. Check the equipment you have your blood given said it should be under a septic technique. And then ensure blood is flowing and set the correct rate and inform losses blood is running and make sure the observation are made. You have to make sure the patient is the patient's name, the patient's details. After the patient details, you have to check the vitals of the patient, you have to document and you should monitor that blood at least in the first 15 to 30 minutes if there are reactions managing. So to calculate transfusion rates, we have our drip rates where we have the volume to be transfused times drop factor over time in minutes. So let's say we are transfusing 450 mils of blood. The drop factor for each one mil of blood, the drop factor is like 20 drops. And then the time for transfusion is four hours. So, so when you get your blood from the blood bank, make sure you transfuse it within 30 minutes of arrival, please. Then you should transfuse it. It should not be greater than four, four, four hours. When the blood comes, you calculate, okay, how many drops do I want to give this patient? So say we are transfused, we are transfusing one pint, that is around 450. You say 450 times drop factor, which is constant, that is at least 20 drops in one mil, or over, over time, that is time, that is four hours, but then four hours in minutes, so you would like four times 60. It will give you the number of drops you, you transfer. So to say, if you calculate it, it will give you something around 30 mils. So you, you sorry, 30 drops, so you transfer 30 drops 
that is in one minute. But it is very important and logical for you to at least reduce this drop rate in the first 15 minutes because most reactions happen within the first few minutes of transfusion. So you maybe step it down to 15 drops per meal. After 15 minutes, you can step it up to 30. After an hour, you can increase it up to 60 to 80 drops. And in case where there is rapid blood loss, you can squeeze that blood from the blood bag. Elderly and children, you should not give them a drop rate greater than 40 drops per minute. So it should be less than 40. Then in people with comorbidities, let's say heart condition, you won't want to overload the heart. Then the signs and symptoms of drug transfusion reaction, fever, uticaria, pruritus, pain along the vein, cough, hypertension, difficulty in breathing, tachycardia, jaundice, and dark colored urine. So before even transfusing this thing, the, the, the blood, you can tell the patient, okay, whenever you feel like your temperature is rising, as I said before, intratransfusion includes assessment includes vitals. So we have to check your vitals. What is the temperature, the respiratory rate, pulse rate, so that in case that is a transfusion reaction, you know that, okay, before it was 36.4, now it is 38.4. Then the pulse rate is very vital. So in case of transfusion reaction, the first thing you do is to stop the blood transfusion. You should wash normal saline, at least one liter. Then you give them, if there is any anaphylactic reaction, you give her the cortisone. If there is, if, if in case of massive blood transfusion, you give adrenaline, promethazine, then you check the vitals and take blood from contralateral hand. You send it back to the lab, then you inform your seniors. We have complications of blood transfusion. Complications could be immunological, not immunological, early or late. In immunological, we have hemolytic action to red blood cells, then the fibrin reaction to red blood cells, and it is often as a result of incompatibility between the antigen on the donor white blood cells and the antibody in the patient's recipient plasma. So we have uticaria, anaphylactic reaction, hygienic infection, HIV, hepatitis B and C, circulatory overload, which leads to pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure. So when you are Transfusing your blood, your history is very important. Did you have any cardiac condition, kidney condition? So that you know that, okay, I'm not going to give this person whole blood. I'll give them packed cells. And you also you also give them under fusomide cover. Then DVT, iron overload, air embolism, graft force disease, the malaria. The trial is defined as a new or worsening acute lung injury or acute respiratory distress syndrome occurring during or within six hours after blood transfusion, it is, it is a diagnosis of exclusion after other causes of acute lung injury have been ruled out. The trial is thought to be as a result of reaction between the donor's antibodies and recipient leukocytes, leading to release of inflammatory mediators and subsequent lung injury. They present with dyspnea, fever, chills, and chest pain. What is massive blood transfusion? It's a blood transfusion is massive when you can give the patient the whole, um, like the patient's whole blood, at least like 10 minutes of blood within 24 hours, or half of the patient's blood within one hour. Half its complication, which could be volume related or rate related. Volume related could be dilution of thrombocytopenia or dilution of propagland factors like factor 5 and 8. The rate related complication could be hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hyperkalemia, acidosis, and hyperthermia. So, blood substitute. In case the patient does not want to get blood, like the whole reference, what do you do to them? The substitute could include plasma substitute, red cell substitutes, and platelet substitute. Plasma substitute, you could give crystalloids like normal saline and ringer's lactate, with colloids like dextran, gelufosine, dextran, you could give albumin, and these starches, the hepa starch and penta starch. Then the red cell substitutes, we have the diaspine, crosslink HP. Fluorocarbon, carbon stem, trauma free HP. For the platelet, it could be platelet recombinant human megakaryos type factor. Then, in conclusion, blood is a powerful therapeutic agent. Rational and judicious use is paramount. You have always agreed to risk and benefits. Are my references. If I have a question, what is fresh whole blood? Because it has been argued, some people say it is a first part of collection. Some people say it's 24 hours, some people say it's 72. So I really need clarification. The trolley, 
One of the things to be known is that it's non-cardiogenic. It's not due to an overload and it's acute onset. And before then, patient is normal, has normal respiration. The SPO2 is fine, he's breathing well. Before transfusion, then after transfusion, we can have the decrease in SPO2. Just x-ray is done. We'll have concentrate in the lungs, but it's not related to either overload or other causes. That's when we'll say it's trialing and it's managed based on how we manage our ARDS. So it's mostly supportive care. We can give some form of diuretics. We might put patient on oxygen support for a while till that clears up. It's more of an immunological reaction. Fresh your blood, you want to comment on that? A warm blood that uh, has been transfused within the first three hours. Yes. So the other 24 and 72 hours, I've not heard of it. I don't know which literature they're talking about. Yes. So from collection, to transfusion is three hours you understand so it's collected and used up used up within three hours of donation now i'll go to the blood administration the blood administration the 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 formula you gave us did not take into cognizance the type of blood products that we have because the the formula is drop rate equal to volume times drop factor over time in minutes now the the amount of blood you give the formula will depend should 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 vary depending on the type of blood whether it's whole blood sedimented cells or packed cell we'll not be able to will not give everything we will not give the same volume of what we we'll give when we are giving the different um, types of um, blood components that formula did not take into cognizance the different types of the different components so a simple formula is hb deficit times the weight times the constant the constant is because the, it also did not take into cognizance the HB def, the deficit, the hemoglobin deficit. Do you get? Some people use PCV, some people use hemoglobin deficit. But if you're using that hemoglobin deficit, you the constant to be six for whole blood, four for sedimented cells, and three for packed cells. Blood transfusion reaction occur within the first 30 minutes of transfusion. So you should be there, ensure that you give it slowly, 20 to 30 drops per minute, first and then before you subsequently increase to 60 to 80. That's after the first um, um, hour, when you're sure there's no um, problem. So that's one of the things. The effect of storage, yes, once you store it in the blood, so the storage is when you store that blood you get in the, in the, for, for the whole, for the whole, for the, for the blood, usually we store blood uh, one to four degrees Celsius. You can, so those are the effect of storage of blood for the other, Crowd precipitate less than minus 40 degrees Celsius and then FFP. So all of them, all the blood components vary based on what you are giving. Your indications, I like the fact that in the end, when you started talking about your component therapy, you now broke down and you are mentioning the indications for each of the component therapy. So you see that you will not be able to give an all-encompassing all indication if you are not giving indication based on the component therapy or taking note of the or giving us, if you are not giving indications based on the component therapy. So that's something you should also um, take note of. You also told us about alternatives to blood transfusion. Remember that apart from alternatives to blood transfusion, well, other alternatives include drugs. We can give, we have our drugs, we give fessolate, erythropoietin. Other things we can do, alternatives to blood transfusion, that is if you must not transfuse, that sometimes you may not have all these things. Or you have your tranexamic tran acid, Things that will help you reduce blood loss are also is also an alternative. Your surgical, meticulous surgical dissection, and then all those intraoral blood salvage. Especially a child that does not have acute blood loss, you want to correct, let's say, chronic anemia in a child. Are there rules to follow? For children, we do not want to overload them, so we have to calculate and know the exact dose of blood to give them. For the calculation, it would be desired um, Hb minus the current Hb. HB or desired PCV minus current PCV times the constant times constant, which is um, let's say if it is whole blood or packed cells, four or six, then all over three. Three is also a constant in case we are using PCV. So it is PCV is uh, HB is HB times three is PCV. So all over three times the weight of the baby. Sorry. Yes. So in addition to this, you don't want to give more than 20 meals per kg in a day. 
So that's what you're talking about, overload. That's why you see that in children, you, you tend to spread the blood you give them, isn't it? Usually, if you're not co correcting, I <laughs> Yes, so that's it. So you take note that you don't want to give more than 20. But if it's someone that's having acute ongoing, ongoing blood loss or you're in theater, do you get you can now give, you still calculate and give what the child needs. So you should take note of um, all those. In adults, of course, you just calculate. Adults, instead of using this formula, this formula we've talked about, either PCV or HP deficit times weight times constant is for children. In adults, by how many um, grams does PCV increase? By one unit of blood, by how many by how many percent does it increase the PCV? And by, and and by how many many does it increase the HP? Increases the PCV by three percent. That is the HP by ten percent, nine to ten percent. Okay, so the HB is one gram. It increases HB by one gram, PCV by three percent. So in an adult, so you just do the you do the expected minus what you have to get the deficit. So Based on these factors you mentioned, you now divide, if it's PCV, you divide by three so that you know how many units you need to give the adult. If you are not in a haste, you can give two units in a day and then spread it. Maybe sometimes people come with severe um, anemia, PCV 5%. You don't give all the, how many units, maybe if you've calculated, you need five units of blood. You don't rush and give all the five. If it's not acute ongoing blood loss, like those massive upper GI bleeding, if it's severe anemia, you gradually correct, like you give two and then gradually spread it over the rest of this. As a surgeon, I was expecting to um, hear more about the surgical principles of blood transfusion. So some of the general principles surrounding, you know, transfusion of blood or blood products in surgery. One, transfusion is just part of the patient's management. So always remember, take the patient as a whole. Number two, blood loss should be minimized to reduce that patient's need for blood transfusion. So as much as possible, we know that, as you mentioned in your presentation, that blood transfusion, blood and blood product transfusion has its own risk, has its own risks, isn't it? So as much as possible, you should try as part of the surgical principles to minimize the blood loss of your patient using various means and then the patient with an acute blood loss should receive adequate resuscitation, isn't it? If a patient comes in with trauma, you make sure that you replace uh, fluids, you give your IV fluids, you give your oxygen while you are preparing your blood, uh, while you are preparing the blood for blood transfusion. Then number four, just remember that even though that the, the patient's hemoglobin value is important. That shouldn't be the only deciding factor when you're starting your blood transfusion. That your blood transfusion should be supported by your clinical signs and symptoms, isn't it? Because we are taking the patient as a whole. So you make sure that, yes, you, are, you have your HB level, it seems to be a borderline, you know, uh, it seems to be low, but clinically, mm, do you really believe in that value? bearing in mind your, you know, you vis-a-vis -vis your patient's um, symptoms and signs, because you know that in medicine, you marry your clinical symptoms and signs with what you're seeing uh, with your laboratory indices. Then number five, always remember as a clinician, as a surgeon, you should be aware of the risks of, you know, the risks of blood transfusion and also the blood product transfusion. And then bear that in mind when you're managing the patient, you are the first on call, you try and make sure that you're on ground when that blood or blood product, then that blood is available, when that blood product is available. And I'm happy that you mentioned that at least you should be available within the first 15 minutes before handing over to the nurses on the ward. If you can even stay a bit longer because, well, it's your patient and you are, you know, you are responsible for your patient. So you try and make sure that, um, you know, you're on ground, you're nearby in case of any uh, blood in case of any acute blood transfusion reaction. And then you should always remember that your transfusion should be prescribed only when the benefits to the patient are likely to out outweigh the risks. So you balance it. Whether you are doing um, blood transfusion, whether you're going to uh, do your blood transfusion in the acute setting or whether you're going to do it in the chronic setting, you should always weigh, you know, the risks, the advantages, the disadvantages. 
if this kind of question is brought to you in the examination, either as an oral, either as a short case, uh, remember that you have to mention, apart from these general principles, your pre-operative, intra-operative, post-operative principles must be mentioned, and they are quite extensive. I'll not go into it because that is just a whole different <laughs> presentation. But as a clinician, as a surgeon, yes, everything she's mentioned is relevant. However, surgically, there's much more than that. Um, yeah, I didn't hear anything about transfusion trigger. So regarding the transfusion triggers, uh, some clinical and symptoms would uh, match with some laboratory investigations to know when to transfuse. Uh, it might be clinically when we have a pill patient with other tachycardia uh, associated with other comorbidities. Maybe we have a patient with um, hemic murmur due to anemic heart failure. We can start preparing for uh, transfusion. Then um, we, when we have a patient with a chronic uh, maybe wound that needs wound dressing and there is constant blood loss, with uh, signs of anemia, we might need to transfuse in order to do uh, that. Ongoing blood loss. Then um, iron deficiency anemia is there as part of it. I'm not sure whether that's what you're looking for. Okay, good attempt. Anybody else? Yes, yes minimum. go ahead. HB or PCV at which um, an individual should be transfused. In addition to the clinical she has mentioned. Yes. Since, you know, universally, we know that, okay, one of the main objective uh, deciding factors for deciding whether or not you're going to transfuse a patient who requires, um, you know, blood or blood products is the hemoglobin level. That is the universally accepted, you know, value, objectively, isn't it? But we should know, as I mentioned before, that you should marry that with your patient's clinical signs and symptoms. So because of that, there's actually no universal <laughs> transfusion trigger. So your decision to transfuse your patient should be based on the clinical assessment of the patient, of course, supported by the results of the laboratory tests. And you should follow evidence-based guidelines. And so, but you should also remember that, of course, there's no trigger for patients with massive hemorrhage, isn't it? For patients that are, you know, acutely bleeding from, you know, traumatic injuries, there's no transfusion trigger. You just go ahead. And then in most stable or non-bleeding patients, Typically, most times, uh, a typical um, hemoglobin level of about, let's say, seven grams per deciliter usually appears to be like, okay, relatively safe, you know, hemoglobin, uh, relatively safe, should I say, transfusion trigger, in which you should, you will decide that, okay, fine, maybe let, let me just say that, okay, fine, patient has a hemoglobin level of about seven grams per deciliter, you know, okay, has some symptoms, some, some signs of um, anemia, you may decide that you will transfuse your patient. And then remember that, you know, in patients with uh, heart or lung disease, you know, those ones are usually probably less able to compensate for anemia. So for your hemoglobin, the, the decision to transfuse in them, may, you may actually decide to transfuse much earlier for them. Your, transf your transfusion trigger may not be the same as for patients that, you know, are relatively um, normal patients with no comorbidities. And so I think, yes, that is generally it. It can be asked in the examination, so have that in mind. I think you should go and read more about it. Remember that if your patient is symptomatic, patient has chest pain, has orthostatic hypotension, or even tachycardia, has congestive heart failure, you should remember that um, you should transfuse because patient is symptomatic. But you marry the clinical signs and the symptoms, and then remember, the way you'll transfuse when a patient is acutely, um, uh, acutely anemic and the patient is chronically anemic is different, as Dr. Paki um, has mentioned. Um, principles of blood transfusion, it also involves blood uh, other products, isn't it, Dr. Paki? So I, I, noticed, I noticed that you just dwelled more on the, you know, on whole blood transfusion. You didn't really talk, delve into the blood products. Um, but anyway, by and large, we tried. Um, I expect that this topic will still be discussed 